สวัสดีครับ Hello and welcome to Daily Wisdom, Walking the Path with the Buddha. Today is our Pali Canon English Study Group, where we study the words of the Buddha. I would like to welcome all of you to our class and let you know that the way that we do our classes, we typically will do a meditation first in order to prepare the mind. Then we will move into having a student read each individual chapter that we've been studying this week. And then I will share some teachings related to that particular chapter, and then open up to any questions that you might have. So welcome! Really pleased that you're here. If you've been joining us regularly or you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to welcome everyone, and at the same time invite you to join in meditation. So if you'd like to take a meditation position where you're either seated, lying, or standing, we'll go ahead and guide you in meditation. Just a short little meditation, just to kind of top up the mind and prepare it. For the class ahead, <clears throat> we start with chanting, and if you know these chants, you're welcome to chant along. And then afterwards, I'll come back with some light guidance. Arahang s a m m a s a m u t o m a h a k e w a Wherever you get to your next exhale, just breathe out gradually through the nose. Your breath isn't going to match to the guidance that I'm providing. Just here as guide, it's your practice. So wherever you get to the next inhale, just breathe in naturally through the nose, breathing in. In.
Once the breath is established, start fixating the mind on the sound of the breath or the sensation of air moving into the nose. The breath is the present moment. Fixate the mind on the breath, present moment. Then, whenever you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that thought off, let it go, and come back to the breath, present moment. Breathing in, In. When the mind moves off the breath, you haven't done anything wrong. You're not bad at meditation. This is just the mind moving out of the present moment. What you'd like to do is cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath. No need to observe the thought, label it, judge it, analyze it, or even try to figure out where it's coming from. All you do is when you observe that the mind is off the breath, cut that off, let it go, and come back to the breath, the present moment. Breathing in. In. I'm going to be quiet now and let you do this work, cutting off the thoughts, coming back to the breath. Nowhere to go. There's nothing to do. No one needs you right now. This is your time. Focus the breath. Breathing in. In.
Remember that this meditation is really just a little top up for you just before class. You know, just a very short meditation. I think that might have been maybe 10 or 15 minutes or so. But um, in your own practice, you know, you're building up to two or three sessions per day for 30 minutes or more. And you just need to make more and more space in your life for that because as you get closer and closer to that, that's where you'll see the real progress in the condition of the mind. And it'll help you to practice all the other teachings like right intention, right speech, right action, and all the others. So I'd like to once again welcome all of you if you have joined us since we started meditation. I apologize that we're not able to live stream on Facebook for any of those people that are normally on Facebook. Uh, there's some impermanence somewhere. So thank you for joining us here in Zoom or on YouTube or somewhere else that we might be live streaming this. The chapters that we're focusing on this week are chapters 121 through 130. And as I mentioned, usually what happens is a student will read the chapter. I will then share teachings and then open up to any questions that you guys have on that specific chapter. If you haven't gotten access to these books yet, you can go to buddhadailywisdom.com. From there, you can either download the book and read it that way, or you can download it and print it if you'd like a printed version. Or you can order these books on Amazon in there, no matter where you are that has access to Amazon, since Amazon's throughout the world, you can access it there and, and print, get a printed copy through Amazon. So I'll just turn things over to all of you guys and specifically the moderators to guide us through the class today. Um, let's begin with chapter 120 and we... Mute on, Jan. You need to unmute yourself. <laughs> there you go. 
Nibbana, the destruction of the taints. Venerable sir, it is said, the removal of craving, the removal of anger, the removal of ignorance, a knowing of true reality. Of what now, venerable sir, is this the designation? This monk is a designation for the element of Nibbana, enlightenment, the removal of craving, the removal of anger, the removal of ignorance, the destruction of the taints is spoken of in that way. Thank you, Jan. This is a really short, concise teaching where the Buddha is describing how to get to enlightenment. It's the elimination of craving, anger, and ignorance. These are called the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. This is what a practitioner needs to do in order to get to enlightenment. Just really clear, very simple. But then the work becomes, well, what is craving? You know, what is that? What is anger? What is ignorance? Well, craving is this mental longing and strong eagerness, the mind chasing after the objects of its affection. It's longing, it's yearning, it's lurching forward. This is craving. The mind thinks that if it just acquires this object of its affection, it's going to create some kind of lasting satisfaction. And it bases its inner feelings on whether it acquires this object or not. If you get the object of your affection, there's these pleasant feelings. This is a conditioned feeling of happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, and others. But if you don't get the object of your affection, then there's painful feelings. This anger or sadness or frustration, irritation, annoyance, guilt, shame, fear, and other feelings like this. And the reason why all this is occurring is because of ignorance or the unknowing of true reality. The mind in the unenlightened state, when it's untrained, it lacks the wisdom to understand that it's actually craving desire attachment that's causing all your discontent feelings. Typically, because of this lack of wisdom or this ignorance, a pre an individual is going to blame others or blame the situation. You're making me angry or you're annoying me or you're upsetting me or anything like this. But in reality, it's the mind's own craving. And this is why people haven't been able to solve their anger. They haven't been able to solve their sadness or misery or despair or grief or guilt or shame or fear, any of these other feelings, because they're not looking in the right place. They don't understand the problem. So because of this ignorance, this unknowing of true reality, the unenlightened mind doesn't understand the problem. So therefore, it can't actually get to a solution and actually fix it. So what you're doing on the path to enlightenment is you're not believing the teachings. You're looking to transform these three poisons of craving, anger, and ignorance by arising wisdom. And the way that you arise wisdom is you learn the teachings from a teacher and the resources that a teacher is sharing. Then you reflect on them and you try to independently verify them, whether they're true or false. Because the teachings that lead to an enlightenment, they're not belief. You're not believing in teachings. You're independently verifying whether these teachings are true or not. And that's how you actually arise wisdom. So through your inner reflection about the Four Noble Truths, about the various aspects of the Eightfold Path, about the Five Precepts and others, you're arising this wisdom and seeing the truth in it. And then you start practicing it. You start practicing the Four Noble Truths. You start practicing the Eightfold Path. You start practicing the Five Precepts, for example, and all the others. And that's where you see that your life practice is transformed. The condition of the mind improves and the condition of your life improves where you start having personal and professional relationships that can blossom. Because instead of going around blaming other people for the problems that you're encountering, you understand that you're the one that's responsible for all that you're experiencing. And now with wisdom, you can make wiser decisions which lead to wholesome outcomes. But as long as we don't understand, as long as we have this ignorance and unknowing of true reality, this craving persists where the mind's longing and yearning for the objects of its affection. And then it's only a matter of time before it gets angry and hostile and bitter and aggressive with unskillful conduct because it's not getting the objects of its affection. And the reason why all this is occurring is because of ignorance and the unknowing of true reality. So you're transforming these three poisons of craving, anger, and ignorance by practicing the exact opposites. The exact opposites are generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. 
because with craving, the mind is longing and yearning. It's trying to hold on to things. So practicing generosity of giving and sharing is to let go because you're now giving and sharing. You're sharing your time, effort, energy, and resources. And then instead of anger, that hostility and bitterness and aggressiveness, you're practicing loving kindness, this genuine interest in seeing all beings be well, interested in seeing all beings be peaceful, having this active goodwill towards others. And then instead of this ignorance or this unknowing of true reality, you're practicing wisdom, where now you're making decisions through wise decision-making. And sometimes that requires you to step back and just think about the situation before you actually make a decision. Because what craving wants you to do is it wants you to go, 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 make a whole bunch of decisions real quick. Hurry up. I, I want to get this craving fulfilled. I want to get the objects of my affection. I'm chasing after this object of my affection like an animal chasing a prey. That's what craving wants you to do. But with wisdom, you understand that that's going to lead to unwholesome results. So you restrain the mind and you pull it back and you say, okay, I've got some decisions to make here. Let me slow down. Let me ensure that there's not craving here. And let me make some wise decisions because that's going to lead to wholesome outcomes. If you allow the mind to make decisions based in craving, based in anger, or based in ignorance, then it's going to produce unwholesome results. This is unwholesome gamma. The results of our decisions are going to be unwholesome or we're going to experience unwholesome gamma. This is the results of our decisions. Whenever we base our decisions in craving, anger, and ignorance, we're going to experience unwholesome results. But when we base our decisions in generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom, now we're going to experience wholesome results. And like I mentioned, that requires the mind to be restrained as you're making your way to enlightenment, you're going to need to restrain the mind on multiple occasions. That's where right mindfulness comes in, is having awareness of the mind. And that's where right effort comes in, that you actively apply the effort to eliminate those unwholesome qualities and arise the wholesome. So by restraining the mind and pulling it back, making decisions more wisely, then over time, the mind arises more and more wisdom. You're practicing generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. And the mind is able to do this effortlessly. But as you're making your way to enlightenment, you have to apply the effort to arise these qualities of right mindfulness and right effort, for example. And then once you do, with the elimination or the removal, the words that the Buddha is using here, with the removal of craving, the removal of anger, and the removal of ignorance, ignorance. You've destroyed the taints. These taints are pollutions of mind. And when you've destroyed the pollutions of mind, now you can function in a way that is going to lead to wholesome results because you're only making wise decisions. When there's craving, a being's going to tend to make selfish decisions based on central desire. And then that anger is arising and pushing people away from you because of the aggressiveness and bitterness and harshness. And all of this is happening because of ignorance. So when we remove all of that, now we can function through generosity, loving kindness, and wisdom. And now we can effortlessly live in harmony and peace with all beings because we're not causing harm to others. We're not chasing our selfish desires. We're fulfilling our needs. We're taking care of the things that we need in life and taking care of our necessities in short that we can to sustain our life. We're caring for the people around us and ensuring that we're you know, practicing things like loving kindness and compassion. But we're not doing that with craving, this longing, this yearning, the mind lurching forward. So let me see what questions you guys have about this chapter. You can put those into Facebook, YouTube, or Zoom, or actually today, YouTuber or Zoom, or you can electronically raise your hand in Zoom and ask any questions that you like. Thank you, Teacher David. Chantana asks, is the removal of craving, anger, ignorance, is the removal of craving, anger, and ignorance considered right view, uh, number two in eight full path? Yeah. Okay, so right view is all about understanding the Four Noble Truths and practicing the Four Noble Truths. That's where you understand the problem is discontentedness, the cause of the problem is craving, desire, attachment, that mental longing and strong eagerness. 
you understand the elimination of the problem is the elimination of craving anger or sorry craving desire attachment by eliminating craving desire attachment that mental longing then you eliminate discontentedness and then the fourth aspect of the four noble truths is the way forward or the path forward is the eightfold path so right view is all about the four noble truths but what you're doing as part of the entire Eightfold Path is the Buddha is guiding you without you necessarily understanding it 100% is when you first start learning the Eightfold Path, you might not have understood craving, anger, and ignorance, but he's guiding you to eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance and giving you the tools on the Eightfold Path of how to do that. And then when you get deeper into learning, you can understand that what he's doing is guiding you to eliminate this craving, anger, and ignorance. And then you can learn at an even deeper level what he's guiding you to do is eliminate the 10 fetters. Because craving anger and ignorance is like a high level description of what the problem is in the unenlightened mind. But then the 10 fetters is the real detailed description of each individual problem in the mind. Each of those 10 fetters can be linked back to craving anger and ignorance in one way or another. And when we talk about the problem as craving, anger, and ignorance as the three poisons or the three unwholesome roots or the three fires. There are certain solutions that we can talk about at that level, that generalized level. But then when you understand the problem in more detail of the 10 fetters, then you can get more exact and more specific with what the problem is and how to actually eradicate each one of those 10 fetters. So the three poisons of craving, anger, and ignorance it isn't right view. It isn't part of right view in terms of the way that the Buddha describes it as part of the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is just describing right view as the Four Noble Truths. But if you understand that craving, anger, and ignorance is the problem, this is helping you to refine your understanding of what the problem is so that then you can implement the solution. So the three poisons aren't a direct link to the right view in the Eightfold Path, but you can see how somebody understanding the three poisons, they're help, they're, it helps you to establish more and more of right view by understanding that, yes, the real problem is in my own mind, that I have craving, anger, and ignorance. That's why there's discontentedness, and I need to eradicate these in order to get rid of discontentedness. That's right view. And if you understand that it's craving, anger, and ignorance, this is helping to support your right view, but it's not right view directly as the way that the Buddha explains it in the Eightfold Path. Thank you, Teacher David. Uh, Chantana just made a, a correction. Actually, what was meant was right intention. So is there anything that you have not said in regards to right intention that you can speak to as far as it relates to the removal of craving, anger, yeah, so everything that the Buddha is teaching you is all directed to eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance. Even right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, right concentration. Every step on the Eightfold Path is directly related to the elimination of craving, anger, and ignorance. But with right intention, it's important to understand those three aspects. The intention of renunciation, the intention of non-ill will, and the intention of uh, harmlessness. All of these, by cultivating those intentions, are leading to the elimination of craving, anger, and ignorance. But as I mentioned, so is right speech, right action, right livelihood, and all the rest. So it's important to understand that the path to enlightenment is the Eightfold Path and understanding each of those steps individually and then understanding kind of what the real problem is as in why this Eightfold Path is the perfect prescription or how to eliminate craving, anger, and ignorance. Because when you understand what craving, anger, and ignorance is, you understand that the Eightfold Path is the perfect prescription to helping you eliminate it from the mind. Thank you, Teacher David. And I have a question in regards to um, the destruction of the taints. What if I am working on eliminating greed or, or you know, craving, anger, and, and such um, and ignorance. What if I'm working on these things to destroy the taints? 
once that has done been done you have often said in the past that nibbana is a permanent state of being as opposed to all states is it possible for me to whittle away and destroy these taints and to allow them back if they once i've reached them? yeah if they've been eliminated from the mind they won't come back but what can happen is uh, you can have a craving that goes dormant for a while and then it it uh, arises so it's still in the mind it's still there it hasn't been eliminated but you just might not be seeing it and observing it because it hasn't arisen for a period of six months or a year or something like that so once it's eliminated it's eliminated it will never come back but what happens is they sometimes go dormant just like as you're making your way to enlightenment the lights flickering and giving you glimpses of what enlightenment is like as these pollutions are going down they also flicker on the way out that they gradually diminish kind of like a light bulb if you turned on a light bulb for enlightenment it's going to flicker 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 and then boom it's on right and it's just always on the same thing is when a light bulb's going out when it's being extinguished usually at the end of its life it will flicker 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 flicker, flicker and then boom it's out and it's completely out so the same thing happens with these pollutions that you'll see that same effect that you can be experiencing kind of a dormant stage where you're just not noticing any arising of that specific craving but it's still there so this is where the buddha talks about being on guard you need to always be on guard and what guard is is guard is the guard is your mindfulness by practicing right mindfulness or awareness of mind this is guarding the mind so that if you're trying to eliminate something like say like um when i was eliminating coffee right like i would go like a week without drinking coffee and then boom i would have a craving to go drink it and i would go get a, a glass of a cup of coffee and then i would go like two weeks without drinking it and boom then it would arise and i would go get a, a cup of coffee I would go four weeks and then boom i even went as long as eight weeks one time and i was like ah this is great you know i got rid of this coffee you know feeling a little bit prideful you know not going out and boasting to people but just internally in the mind like yeah i got this thing licked you know I, i'm done and then boom like here it comes you know and it, and it comes back and it came back after eight weeks and i drank like a, a third of a cup or a half of a cup and then i was like i'm done with this and i threw it away because it just produced headaches and an excited mind i didn't prefer to have that and then from that point forward i haven't had another cup of coffee for like four years so it was flickering on the way out and getting these gaps of time where i didn't experience the arising of craving for coffee or caffeine or the sugar or the milk that was in the coffee but during that period of time the craving was still there during that eight weeks it hadn't been fully extinguished yet and once it was extinguished and completely removed that particular craving was removed and then what you're looking to do is remove all cravings because all those cravings are going to ultimately produce anger if the mind doesn't get the objects of its affection and what you're doing with the buddhist teachings is you're arising the wisdom of how to do that thank you sir miranda has some questions Yes, thank you, Rick. On YouTube, uh, Papiko asks, what is the true reality? The true reality is the natural laws of existence. So there are certain things that the unenlightened mind believes. It has these false beliefs. It has this misunderstandings, this confusion, or this misperceptions about the world around us. And because it misunderstands these things, it doesn't know the truth, so therefore it struggles. And let me just give you one simple example. The unenlightened mind doesn't understand the universal truth of impermanence. You know, when we're off the path, we don't understand the universal truth of impermanence, that things are constantly changing, and that there's not this fixed state. So then when your cell phone falls and it breaks, the mind's like, ah, you know, it gets angry or frustrated because the phone broke. But that's because of the unknowing of true reality. The mind lacks the wisdom of the universal truth of impermanence. It thought, it had the misperception, it had the misunderstanding, it had the confusion or the false belief that this 
phone is permanent. And now because of its craving and clinging and holding on to this phone, when it met with impermanence, the unenlightened mind didn't like that. And this is where discontentedness arises. So by understanding each of the Buddhist teachings, where you learn them, you reflect on them to start to independently verify them, and then you practice them, then you can see more and more of the truth and you understand true reality. But in the unenlightened state, there's all kinds of things that the mind is ignorant to or it's unknowing of, it lacks wisdom. The universal truth of impermanence is just one. And the whole path to enlightenment, the Buddha is explaining to you the natural law of karma. Another example is like right speech. The Buddha is arising the wisdom and helping you understand right speech. He's giving you those four aspects in the Eightfold Path where he's talking about uh, eliminating lying, eliminating slander, eliminating harsh speech, and eliminating frivolous speech. And then he even gives you these five factors of well-spoken speech that you can arise this wisdom of the five factors of well-spoken speech. And then with that wisdom, now you practice it, right? You learn it, you reflect on it, and you practice it, and you see the truth for yourself. So what the mind is unknowing of is it's unknowing <clears throat> of these natural laws of existence. It's unknowing of the natural law of gamma. It doesn't understand the cause and effect. This is why a being, when they're practicing being aggressive and harsh and bitter, they don't understand why people don't want to be around them, right? They think that everyone else is the problem. Because they're practicing wrong view, they think everyone else is the problem. They think that the other people are causing their anger. And now they are, have this aggression, this bitterness, this hostility. They lash out like an animal. And now they don't understand why people don't want to be around me. You know, why don't people want to be around me? Well, it's because you're blaming them for your problems. It's because you're being harsh and aggressive and hostile. And why is all this occurring? Because of ignorance, the unknowing of true reality. And because of that ignorance, they're still craving and there's still anger. And then there's this unskillful conduct. So the true reality is understanding the natural laws of existence in the natural law of gamma. Thank you, sir. And then also on YouTube, uh, Chris Rice asks, how will I know when it's time to focus on understanding the 10 fetters instead of just focusing on learning, reflecting, and understanding the three universal truths, four noble truths, and noble eightfold path? What I suggest is that you build up a really strong foundation of understanding those four teachings of the four noble truths, which includes the, you know, I include in there the three universal truths the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, you should know these inside and out, backwards and forwards. Like if somebody sat down and said, Chris, can you explain to me right intention? And you're like, oh, it's got three aspects to right intention. There's the intention of renunciation. There's the intention of non-ill will. There's the intention of harmlessness. What the intention of renunciation is, is the letting go, the giving up of false beliefs and misperceptions, giving up of unwholesomeness. The practice of non-ill will is actually practicing goodwill or loving kindness, uh, being interested in seeing all beings be well, and harmlessness is being incapable and unwilling or uninterested in causing harm to other beings. So you should be able to kind of effortlessly explain the Eightfold Path because you've learned it so deeply and you're practicing it that it's effortless and you're bringing your practice up closer and closer to that. So if you're able to articulate from memory what the Eightfold Path is, then you've got that one solid. And now, all that time you've been building up your meditation practice, you should get to the point where you're starting to see the jhanas and starting to experience the jhanas. And now you know your mind's ready to learn something new because you've essentially mastered the three universal truths, the four noble truths, the Eightfold Path, the five precepts and other things like this. And now it's time to move on and start looking at something else more deeply. And one of the ways that the Buddha encouraged people to arise this wisdom in the mind and be able to effortlessly talk about these teachings is that amongst the community of practitioners is that 
in class, you know, I'm sharing with you guys the teachings, I'm sharing in the books, the videos, and all these other things. But you guys as a community can be discussing these teachings with each other. And this is what helps to articulate what the teachings are. And it arises the understanding of the teachings in the mind. Because if you're just studying a book and you haven't really articulated it and heard yourself explaining it to somebody, then you're not really necessarily sure whether you know it or understand it or not. So I think that there's a group that Miranda and others have started where they're uh, talking with each other about the teachings and different things going on in life that I'm not in that group and you guys can talk as a community to be able to uh, you know kind of articulate the teachings a bit and get more comfortable and that's another great thing about having retreats and events like I'm going to be taking a Buddhist pilgrimage tour with students is as you come together with other practitioners you guys can be discussing the teachings and you can be doing that in private messages and private conversations as well and this will help you to confirm and build your confidence that you're understanding the teachings not from an arrogant or conceited perspective but just as a way of arising the understanding of the teachings in the mind and as say that you were articulating right intention to Miranda and Miranda's like oh I understand right intention differently than that <clears throat> I understand it like this and then you're like, oh, I haven't thought about it like that. And then maybe you guys are having a disagreement of what right intention is. And disagreement's fine. You can disagree politely, kindly, friendly, and respectfully. And then where you're having a disagreement, you're able to consult the book or you're able to consult the resources. Or if that doesn't sort out your misunderstanding, then you can consult the teacher and say, hey, teacher, can you help us with this? You know, Chris is thinking that right intention involves this. Miranda's thinking that it involves this. Can you help clarify our misunderstanding and why are we disagreeing about what right intention is, for example? And then a teacher can help you. But nowadays we have resources to be able to help you to see that. So this is how you arise the wisdom and then you gain this confidence that you know the Eightfold Path and all the other four teachings like the back of your hand. And then that's the time to really start focusing on the 10 fetters because you need all those basic core teachings in place before the mind's really ready to let go of those 10 fetters. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, there are no other questions on YouTube at this time, sir. All right. Does that mean we're moving on to the next one, Rick? Yes, sir. All right. So we'll go to chapter 122. All right. I'll read that. The destruction of craving is Nibbana, also known as enlightenment. Venerable sir, it is said, a being, a being. In what way, venerable sir, is one called a being? One is stuck, Radha, tightly stuck in desire, longing, excitement, and craving. Form. Therefore, one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement, and craving for feelings. But one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, desire, longing, excitement, and craving for perceptions. Therefore, one is called a being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement, and craving for volitional formations also known as choices or decisions. Therefore, one is called being. One is stuck, tightly stuck, in desire, longing, excitement, craving for consciousness. Therefore, one is called Suppose, Radha, some little boys or girls are playing with sand. Because they are not free of desire, longing, thirst, passion, and craving for those sandcastles, they cherish them, play with them, treasure them and treat them possessively. But when those little boys or girls lose their desires, longing, excitement, thirst, passion, and craving for those sandcastles, then they scatter them with their hands and feet, polish them, shatter them, and put them out of play. So too, Radha, scatter form, polish it, shatter it, put it out of play, practice for the destruction of craving, Scatter feeling, perception, volitional formations, consciousness, demolish it, shatter it, put it out of play, practice for the destruction of craving. 
the destruction of craving rada is okay thank you rick so here there's a few different things that the buddha is talking about here we can go through it piece by piece so here his student is asking him venerable sir um you know essentially what is a being you know what is a living being is what he's asking and what he describes is he describes what's called the five aggregates the five aggregates are form feelings perceptions volitional formations or that's choices and decisions and then consciousness these are the five things that make a living being a living being and the buddha explains this in other parts of his teachings as well that a living being is going to have physical form like this physical body there's going to be certain feelings that are in the mind there's going to be certain perceptions perceptions are things like uh, how things seem to be in the world your your opinions and beliefs about how things seem in the world then there's volitional formations like choices and decisions and then there's consciousness or the mind so you don't just believe this right you learn it so the buddha is saying that a living being has five aggregates these five things so now you start reflecting on it do you have physical form do you have feelings do you have perceptions the way things seem in the world do you make choices and decisions and do you have a consciousness or a mind because you're a living being we know that you're a human being so do you have these five things the answer is yes okay well now let's take something like a tree which oftentimes we say is alive the tree is alive but is it a living being in the way that the Buddha is describing it? Does it have physical form? Yes, it has physical form, right? There's structures there. Does it have feelings? Some people say that they do, some people say that they don't. I would say that they don't have feelings. Do they have perceptions? Perceptions is, does the tree sit there and like, you know, I kind of like this bark that I have and this bark is actually quite nice. And I appreciate that I have this kind of bark and this is a good type of bark to have in the world, right? Does it have perceptions about the way things seem in the world? I would say it doesn't. Does it have volitional formations, choices and decisions? Is it able to make a choice? Is the tree able to say, you know, I don't like being planted here in this valley. I would like to be up there on that mountain. I'm gonna uproot myself, walk up to the top of the mountain and replant myself because I would like to make a different choice and decision and plant myself in a different location. I would say that a tree doesn't have the ability to make choices and decisions. And this is because they also don't have a consciousness. The consciousness is a mind. It doesn't have a mind, so therefore it doesn't have feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and it doesn't have a consciousness. It only has physical form. So while we may talk about a tree as being alive, which isn't too harmful because you know we can respect it as a uh, important thing to have in the world but it's not a living being in that it doesn't have these five aggregates a living being is going to have these five aggregates and this can help you observe you know is a dog a living being is a cat a living being is a monkey a living being is this bacteria a living being right this bacteria while we call this bacteria or this virus alive it's actually not a living being. If you understand the five aggregates, you can see that it doesn't make choices and decisions. It doesn't have a consciousness. It doesn't have feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, or consciousness. So there we can see like, yeah, we can kill that bacteria in the body and we're not killing a living being. Or we can kill that virus in the body, we're not killing a living being. So the Buddha is explaining here that a living being is gonna be stuck essentially clinging and craving holding on to form feelings perceptions volitional formations and consciousness this is the way that the buddha explains in the four noble truths about what is the problem in the unenlightened mind is that if you're craving or clinging to this physical form wanting it to be permanent but yet now you experience sickness or now you experience aging or now you experience death there's going to be discontentedness in the mind or if you cling and crave, have this longing and yearning holding onto these feelings or perceptions, how things seem in the world, if you cling to these, there's going to be discontentedness. If you cling to your decisions, if you make a decision that you're going to do something six months from now, and then you cling to that decision, even though there's all this evidence that tells you that you should change your decision, 
you're not willing to do that because you're clinging to your decision. Now there's going to be discontentedness as part of that, and you're going to probably make an unwise decision. Or if you cling to this consciousness and holding on to the mind, thinking that this is who you are as a person, for example, then there's going to be discontentedness. So the Buddha is explaining that a living being is stuck, tightly stuck, having this mental longing, this excitement, this craving for these five aggregates. And then he says, okay, just like a little boy or a little girl is building a sandcastle, as long as they're longing and yearning, uh, having this excitement, this thirst, this passion, this craving for these sandcastles, then they're going to treat them possessively. They're going to hold on to them very tightly. And if you've ever been playing in a sandcastle and you didn't realize what the mind was doing, that it was holding on to the sandcastle and a wave came in and knocked it over, you're going to be, oh, my sandcastle. You know, you're going to be upset because you're holding on to it so tightly. But when those little boys and little girls eliminate or lose the desire, the longing, not holding on to it, and they demolish the sandcastle, they shatter it, they put it out of play, as the Buddha explains, then they've let it go. So that when the water comes and brushes over the sandcastle that they've scattered, no big deal because they've already let it go. And what he's saying here is he's saying scatter or demolish this holding on, this clinging to the five aggregates. Don't allow the mind to hold on and be possessive of form, feelings, perceptions, volitional formations, and consciousness. Because if you hold on and you have this longing and craving and you're holding on to the five aggregates, then the mind isn't liberated. That if you're craving for this physical form of the body to be this way all the time, then you're going to set yourself up for discontentedness because this body is impermanent. So now when you see a gray hair or you see a wrinkle or you get a little bit of extra fat around the belly or the thighs or the hips or wherever it is, you're going to be discontent. So getting to liberation is understanding that clinging and holding on to the five aggregates, you're stuck, you're tightly stuck. And what you need to do to get liberated is to let go and realize that there is this physical form, you need to take care of it and you need to make wise choices for its health, but don't cling to it expecting permanent health. There's going to be feelings in the mind that are arising, particularly as the mind is unenlightened. There's going to be this excitement, this thrill. There's going to be anger, frustration. But don't cling to those feelings. Let them go. Realize that that's not who you are. The same thing with perceptions. If you have certain views and opinions and beliefs about how things are in the world, you need to train the mind to be willing to let those go. <clears throat> as you learn more information and you gain more wisdom, you need to learn to let go and not cling to these perceptions. Same thing with your choices and decisions or your volitional formations. Training the mind to not cling to decisions that you've made and be willing to let go. And then the same thing with the consciousness or the mind, be willing to let go. And this will help you to destroy craving. There's lots of different cravings that a mind can have in the world. You can crave, hold on to this shirt. You can crave to come to class. You can crave to... Uh, meditate. You can cr be craving, desiring, attached to your partner or your children, but this is all going to lead to discontentedness in the mind. But here the Buddha is specifically talking about the five aggregates and letting go and not being stuck or tightly stuck, craving and clinging to these because it's going to lead to discontentedness. Destroying those cravings, holding on to those things, then this is enlightenment or liberation of mind. This is where the mind becomes peaceful and joyful because the mind is no longer burdened by carrying around this craving. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Looks like we have no questions at this time, sir. All right, so we'll move to chapter 123. Okay, Miranda, would you please read chapter 123 for us? Yes, sir. Directly visible Nibbana, enlightenment. Master Gotama, it is said, directly visible Nibbana, directly visible Nibbana. In what way is Nibbana directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, 
applicable to be personally experienced by the wise. Brahman, one excited by craving, overcome by craving, with mind obsessed by it, intends for his own harm, for the harm of others, or for the harm of both, and he experiences mental discontentedness and sadness. But when craving is abandoned, it is not intent for his own harm, for the harm of others, or for the harm of both, and he does not experience mental discontentedness and sadness. It is in this way, too, that Nibbana is directly visible. One full of anger, overcome by anger, with mind obsessed by it, intends for his own harm, for the harm of others, and for the harm of both, and he experiences mental discontentedness and sadness. But when anger is abandoned, he does not intend for his own harm, for the harm of others, or for the harm of both, and he does not experience mental discontentedness and sadness. It is in this way, too, that Nibbana is directly visible. One who is unwise, overcome by ignorance, unknowing of true reality, with mind obsessed by it, intends for his own harm, for the harm of others, or for the harm of both, and he experiences mental discontentedness and sadness. But when ignorance is abandoned, he does not intend for his own harm, for the harm of others, or for the harm of both, and he does not experience mental discontentedness and sadness. It is in this way, too, that Nibbana is directly visible. When Brahman, one experiences the remainderless destruction of craving, the remainderless destruction of anger, and the remainderless destruction of ignorance, it is in this way that Nibbana is directly visible, immediate, inviting one to come and see, applicable, to be personally experienced by the wise. All right, thank you, Miranda. So here, the Buddha is going into more detail about how to observe that you have attained enlightenment. He's helping you to be able to see how to do that. And what he's describing here is that if one has ex excitement and craving, overcome by craving, their mind being obsessed, what this is is that if you've ever had a certain craving and you've just obsessively chased after it, it's very exhausting, right? And it's carrying around this burden. You might have experienced that towards certain cravings that you've had. This is somebody who is experiencing craving. And I'm sure that we've all experienced that at one point in time. You just might not have been aware that that's what it was, where the mind was chasing after something. And you might have had the intention of harm for yourself, for others, or for both. Um, and in this situation, a person experiences discontentedness and sadness. Discontentedness is those pleasant feelings, painful feelings, neither painful nor pleasant. So that's what's causing all of this discontentedness and sadness. But when craving is abandoned, he says, then he does not intend for his own harm. He does not intend for the harm of others or for the harm of both. And he does not experience mental discontentedness and sadness. So when craving, desire, attachment, that mental longing, strong eagerness is eliminated through training the mind on the path to enlightenment, then there is no longer any discontentedness or sadness. And he says, this is where Nibbana is directly visible, meaning you can see that the mind is enlightened when there's no longer any discontentedness or sadness. And that's going to be for an extended period of time. You'll see for one year, two years, three years, there's no discontentedness in the mind. You'll know that the mind is enlightened, but you're not going to go around and boast about it because you don't have any ego or conceit at that point. You just are probably going to be thankful that you dedicated time, effort, and energy and resources to learning and practicing these teachings. So it's directly visible, meaning you can see for yourself that you've attained enlightenment when you no longer experience discontentedness. And then he explains the same thing about anger and the same thing about ignorance, that when these things are present, there's going to be discontentedness. And when you eliminate them and remove them, then there isn't any discontentedness and sadness. And he says, this is how somebody can experience enlightenment. And it's directly visible for you to see it yourself. You can see that you've attained enlightenment yourself. Somebody doesn't need to tell you if you're enlightened or not. You don't need somebody to say, you know, Rick, you're enlightened now. 
Uh, or if, if I said, Rick, would you like me to tell you if you're enlightened or not? If you said, yes, I would like you to tell me if I'm enlightened. I would say you're not enlightened. Because if somebody's asking you to tell you whether they are enlightened or not, that means they don't know it for themselves because they don't know what enlightenment is. So enlightenment is directly visible because by the time you get to enlightenment, you've done so much learning, so much reflecting, so much practicing. You know exactly what enlightenment is and you're actively working towards it. And as the mind gets closer and closer to it, you'll know that you've experienced and are experiencing enlightenment. You won't need to be told that you're experiencing enlightenment. And this is where the Buddha says his teachings are inviting one to come and see. He talks about this. He tells people to come examine my teachings because he knows if someone starts investigating his teachings, they can independently observe the truth for themselves. So his teachings are inviting one to come and see. They're applicable to your life in being able to eliminate discontent and you can independently observe the truth for yourself. And this enlightenment is personally experienced by the wise. When you arise wisdom in the mind of what enlightenment is and how to attain it, and then you actively work towards attaining it, then he's describing this person as being wise because they are able to experience this through acquiring and accumulating wisdom, arising this wisdom in the mind. You eradicate ignorance, and by eradicating ignorance, you then have the tools to eradicate craving and anger, and you'll be able to experience enlightenment. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Brandon, do you have any questions? Um, yes, sir. On YouTube, relating to how we are eliminating craving um, and overcoming this craving with it and uh, anger and ignorance, Pico asks, how do you eliminate craving for consciousness? The way that you eliminate all craving the generalized training is breathing mindfulness meditation and practicing generosity. So what you're doing is on a daily consistent basis, two to three sessions per day, you're doing breathing mindfulness meditation for 30 minutes or longer, and you're gradually building up to that over time, creating more and more space in your life. And you're also practicing generosity, the giving and sharing of your time, effort, energy, and resources. So those two trainings should be going on all the time. The Buddha describes doing this every day, essentially, practicing generosity, moral conduct, and meditation. This is what we call the way of practice. So that stuff is going on all the time, kind of softening up the mind and kind of training it to be willing to let go of things. And then in terms of the mind itself, the way that you eliminate clinging to it or craving for it is by working to eliminate personal existence view and central desire. By eliminating these two fetters, which are part of the 10 fetters, then you're training the mind to let go and no longer hold on and identifying with this mind as who you are. That's part of personal existence view. And you're training the mind to no longer have craving for central desires. Is longing and yearning through the mind and the other sense spaces for pleasant feelings. As long as the mind's clinging to the mind, thinking that this is your identity and this is who you are, or as long as the mind is longing and yearning through the sense bases for pleasant feelings, then it's going to experience discontentedness. So the breathing mindfulness meditation in generosity is the generalized training, but then in specific situations where you observe with mindfulness what the mind's doing, you train it to let go. So if you're observing that because of personal existence view, if somebody said something uh, disparaging or diminishing to you about this being who you are, if you experience sadness during that time, that's because the mind's craving to hear agreeable things about this physical body or this mind. And you need to train the mind to cut that off and let it go and don't allow the mind to take things personally when somebody says something disparaging. You might still choose to not be around that person because they're negative and disparaging, degrading and diminishing, but you're not going to be able to isolate yourself or insulate yourself from comments like this. People are going to say things about this physical body or this mind, for example, or uh, 
you know, different things that you're involved in. And you just need to understand that when you hear those things, don't allow it to take on this discontentedness. Just understand that this is impermanence, that people aren't going to permanently talk in a positive way about you. And this will help you to train the mind to let go of the mind, no longer see it as who you are as a person. Thank you, sir. Um, I had a question about the previous chapter. I wasn't able to get to the reaction button. Do you prefer that I wait until the end of class for that, or could I ask that question now, sir? Sure, we can go back to this one. Thank you, sir. Um, in reference to where it said the children would treat the sandcastles possessively, is this speaking a bit about self-view and when a practitioner lets go of self-view and realizes the view of non-self, is this when one can begin to notice large steps forward in being able to more easily cut off and let go of craving, desire, and attachments because we no longer have that possessiveness and begin to no longer view anything, even things like perceptions or emotions as belonging to us or ours, so to speak, sir? Everything you just said is true, that if you are letting go of that personal existence view and you no longer see something as being mine, like this is my computer or this is my book or this is my microphone. When you let go of that possessiveness, then yeah, it's more easy to let go of all cravings, desires, attachments. Um, here, this is referring to the mind not understanding impermanence, right? Because when we don't understand the universal truth of impermanence, the mind does become possessive. It does become uh, selfish. It does have central desire where it holds on to things really tightly. Um, so whether he is referring here to personal existence view or uh, central desire or something like that, I don't think we have that level of detail, but all of those things that you just said are 100% true. And by training the mind to not be possessive, then you understand that all these things around you are impermanent. But see, the middle way is that you still take care of these things because oftentimes what the unrelated mind does is it thinks either black or white, or right or wrong, right? It kind of has these two sides. It's like, okay, well, if I'm not possessive of something, then that means I don't care about it and I just let it go and I don't pay attention to it. But that's not actually true either because that's the other side of the spectrum. Possession would be to hold on to something really tight over here, if you're just indifferent about it and you didn't care about it, then that would be the other side of the spectrum. But this middle way is learning, which is very different than what we're used to, is learning how to practice this middle way where, yeah, I need this microphone. And when I travel, I'll put it in a nice bag and I'll pack it in a nice place to try to protect it because I need it in order to teach classes. But should something happen along the way in the travels and it does break, then I just understand that that's impermanence and I did what I could do in order to protect it. But because it's impermanent, it's going to break at some point. So rather than being possessive of this microphone and thinking that it's mine, or rather than over here, not taking care of it and attending to it and ensuring that I can use it you know, long term, that wouldn't be wise either. So the middle way is, let me pack it, let me protect it, let me put it in a nice place in the suitcase, and then when I get to my destination, it'll be protected and I can actually use it. But should it meet with some impermanence along the way, then I understand that and my mind's not gonna be discontent because of it. So when we're possessive over something, then we, the mind can't do that because it's mine, 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 mine. And we don't only do this with material objects in the unenlightened state, we do this with people too, you know, my son or my cats or my dogs or, you know, my food. You know, we hold on to these things and then we try to control our children or we try to control our life partner or we try to control the things that are going on in our life rather than understanding that there's just all this impermanence going on around us and we can provide suggestions, we can provide encouragement, but we can't control all these things. So when you let go and realize that you really don't possess anything because when you die, everything's going to stay here. It's not going with you. So when you can get to that point, there's liberation in that because then the mind's not 
craving and clinging and holding on to all these material possessions and relationships and things like that. And that's where you can get to real peace and liberation. Because if the mind's holding on and clinging to all these things, it's only a matter of time before they meet with impermanence and they're changing, they're fading away, they're being destroyed. It's only a matter of time before the mind becomes discontent when it's possessive. But when you're able to let go and realize that none of these things belong to you, but I'll still care for them and take care of them and make wise decisions as long as they're with me. And then when it does leave me for whatever reason, I can be okay with that because I don't see it as being mine to begin with. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, stemming off of that question, we have one more question about this chapter, it looks like. Is understanding that, oh, Chris Rice, I'm sorry, on YouTube it asks, is understanding that everything we have will be lost a good description of what it is like to understand the universal truth of impermanence, sir? Yes, that's a big part of it, is just understand none of this stuff belongs to you. Essentially, you're a caretaker, right? You're, you're, I'm a caretaker of this microphone, and I'll use it for as long as I have it, and uh, someday it will no longer be mine, either it'll get lost, it'll maybe get stolen, maybe it'll break, uh, maybe it'll just stop working, maybe the technology will get old and it won't work with the computer anymore, who knows, right? At some point, this microphone's no longer going to be mine. I'm just essentially a caretaker for now. Whether it's your clothes, whether it's your computer, whether it's your automobile, whether it's your shoes, you're just a caretaker for right now. And you'll use it for however long you use it, but at some point it's no longer going to be with you. And getting comfortable with that is to understand and uh, develop what the Buddha calls the perception of impermanence. Developing the perception that all these things around us are impermanent. And it would be unwise to cling or hold on to any of it. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, there are no more questions on YouTube at this time, sir. All right, so that means okay. So that means we'll move to chapter one twenty four. Jan, would you please read chapter one twenty four? Yes, thank you, Rick. Directly visible nibbana, spoken by the perfectly enlightened one, shared by the venerable Ananda. It is said, friend, directly visible nibbana, directly visible nibbana. In what way has the perfectly enlightened one? spoken of directly visible nibbana. Dear friend, distant from sense desires, distant from unwholesome mental state, and enters and resides in the first jhana, which is with thinking and pondering, based in seclusion, filled with excitement and joy. To this extent, too, the perfectly enlightened one has spoken of directly visible nibbana in a provisional sense. In reference to the second jhana, the third jhana, the fourth jhana, the base of inf the infinite of space, the base of the infinite of consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception, identical aspects correlating to the first jhana were spoken. Also, the state of directly visible nibbana is provisionally revealed. The elimination of perception and feeling as is the destruction of the taints, is non-provisionally explained to be directly visible nibbana, as in the following passages. In friend, by completely overcoming the base of neither perception nor non-perception, a monk enters and resides in the elimination of perception and feeling, and having seen with wisdom, his taints are completely destroyed. To this extent, friend, the perfectly enlightened one has spoken of directly visible nibbana as a non-provisional permanent sense. Okay, thank you, Jan. Let me explain what he's talking about here. This first part, what the Buddha is talking about is how I talk about how as you're making your way to enlightenment, there's going to be glimpses of what enlightenment is like. Someone might describe this as temporary enlightenment, but that's kind of like an oxymoron because enlightenment is permanent so there's no such thing as temporary enlightenment right but if we would like to talk about it that way that's essentially what's being described down here um is 
I describe it as these glimpses that as the mind's making its way to enlightenment, you might get a few hours or a few days or a few weeks of what enlightenment looks like. You'll feel this peacefulness, this joy, there'll be this calmness in the mind. And you might experience that for several hours, several days, maybe even several weeks. And then boom, something happens in the mind's discontent. And then you work your way through that for a few hours or a few days or what have you. And then the mind moves back to this peacefulness and tranquility and calmness. And then you get however long you get and then boom, here comes another craving that arises and there's some discontentedness that comes in. But you're getting these glimpses of what enlightenment's like. And these time frames might be getting wider and wider of peacefulness. Someone might describe this as temporary enlightenment, but Again, enlightenment is permanent, so there's no such thing as temporary enlightenment. I describe it as these glimpses of what enlightenment is like, and the Buddha is explaining this here as provisional, right? That you're kind of getting the experience of what enlightenment is like. You're getting these glimpses or this, this view of what enlightenment is like, and you're kind of experiencing that in the mind, but there's still some discontentedness there. And then he describes once the mind essentially gets to enlightenment, that then it's permanent. That once the mind is actually experiencing Nibbana itself, now it's non-provisional or it's permanent. And this is where the light's just always on. So you go from experiencing a couple hours of peacefulness, discontentedness, a few days of peacefulness, discontentedness, a few weeks of peacefulness, discontentedness, a few months of, of peacefulness, some discontentedness comes in, right? You get these wider and wider periods. And next thing you know, it's been a year. It's been two years. It's been three years. Hmm, no discontentedness. Looks like the mind's enlightened, right? This is permanent enlightenment. This is what enlightenment truly is, is that it's permanent, that you will no longer experience any discontentedness at all. So you can go a period of six months or even up to potentially close to a year and then boom, here comes some discontentedness. But by that point, you will know exactly what the problem is. You will know exactly how to resolve it. It'll be very short lived. It'll be, uh, you know, not very intense at all in the, because the mind is so close to enlightenment and you had experienced a good three months or six months of this peacefulness and this joy. So when you experience whatever that discontentedness is after six months, you should be able to eradicate it relatively quickly and relatively easily, effortlessly. And now the mind goes back to peacefulness and joy. And you get this period of time where you eventually get to a year, two or three, and you'll know, hmm, thank goodness I spent this time investigating these teachings and practicing them because they lead exactly where the Buddha said they do to this peacefulness, to this liberation, to this enlightenment, to this joy that is always there. And that's what he's essentially explaining here. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Miranda has a question. Yes, sir, thank you. On YouTube, Chris Rice asks, what does Buddha mean when he talks about overcoming neither perception nor non-perception? Sure. So here at the beginning, he's talking about the first jhana uh, right here. And then uh, he talks later about the second, third, and fourth jhana. So as the mind's making its way to the first stage of enlightenment, the mind's going to experience these jhanas and there are certain qualities of mind that a practitioner is going to experience as the mind's moving through these jhanas. He describes this in the Eightfold Path, and I've described it in various classes. As you're putting together the three universal truths, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts, your meditation practice is coming along, you're starting to understand these different uh, aspects of the path, you'll start experiencing these qualities of mind, the first, second, third, and fourth jhana. These are preliminary phases that the mind goes through before it gets to the first stage of enlightenment. And you can observe for yourself through the description of what the Buddha shares and what I share, you can see the mind moving through these jhanas. But then there's these other four attainments that the Buddha talks about. Because everybody who makes their way to enlightenment, they're going to experience these four jhanas. Everybody is going to need to go through those four jhanas, just like they're going to go through the first, second, third stage of enlightenment 
before they actually get to enlightenment itself. Everybody's going to experience that in order to get to enlightenment. But these other four attainments that he's talking about here, where he says the base of infinite space, the base of infinite consciousness, the base of nothingness, the base of neither perception nor non-perception. These are four other attainments that not everybody experiences as part of their journey to enlightenment. I describe what these are in one of the books. I don't remember which book it is. I think it's around book three, perhaps, volume three, where I explain what each one of these attainments are and that you'll understand that you're experiencing those. Well, like one of these is to observe past lives and not everybody is going to observe past lives, for example. Um, but everybody will experience those four jhanas and the four stages of enlightenment in order to get to enlightenment. So I don't teach the detail of exactly what these are so much because some people will experience it, some people won't. There's nothing special that you need to do in order to experience these things. Uh, if they're going to happen, they're going to happen. If they're not going to happen, they're not going to happen. But the teachings that guide you through the main path to enlightenment, if these are going to be experienced, they're going to be experienced. So I explain what they are, just like the Buddha does in one part of the, the teachings. Uh, but there's nothing to teach around them in terms of how to attain them because it's the same thing. It's the Eightfold Path. It's eliminating craving, anger, and ignorance, eliminating the Ten Fetters. If the mind is going to experience these things, it will experience them. Thank you, sir. Also, Chris asks, and what does reaching the state of neither perception nor non-perception offer, if anything? You may have just answered that, though. Yeah, I just answered that, that I don't usually teach this in detail. You can look at it in the book series. If you're having difficulties finding exactly where I taught this, let me know and I will find it for you and then tell you exactly what chapter. Uh, but it's not like a core part of the path to understand these four attainments. But it's something that you can be aware of so that if you experience them, you'll know what they are. Yes, thank you, sir. Uh, there are no more questions on YouTube at this time, sir. And there are no more questions. Okay, we're at chapter 125. So for chapter 125, it looks like I'll be reading that. Nibbana is the very life for enlightenment. There are a householder forms recognizable by the eye that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing, tempting. If a monk does not seek excitement in them, does not welcome them, does not remain holding to them, his consciousness does not become dependent upon cling to them. A monk without clinging attains nibbana, known as enlightenment. There are householder sounds recognizable by the ear, odors recognizable by the nose, flavors recognizable by the tongue, physical objects recognizable by the body, mental objects recognizable by the mind that are desirable, lovely, agreeable, pleasing, sensually enticing. Thing. If a monk does not seek excitement in them, does not welcome them, does not remain holding to them, his consciousness does not become dependent upon them or cling to them. A monk without clinging. This is the cause and reason, householder, why some thing, beings here attain nibbana in this very life. Monk, if through fading away of strong feelings towards the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind, through its fading away and elimination, one is liberated by non-clinging, and can be called a monk who has attained Nibbana, enlightenment. All right, thank you, Rick. So here, the Buddha is explaining how the mind has central desire. This is the fourth fetter as part of the ten fetters. The central desire is where the mind is longing and yearning through the six sense bases, wanting things to be pleasing and agreeable because it wants these pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria. And as long as the mind has this desire through the eyes to see a certain physical form, and it's having this longing and yearning, this chasing after this pleasing object that is 
centrally enticing and tempting. As long as the mind wants this physical form and it's looking through the eyes to see a beautiful woman or a handsome man or this beautiful car or these amazing jewelry and it's chasing, 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 then it's going to experience discontentedness because it's basing its inner feelings on the craving and yearning and longing through the eyes, wanting this impermanent object. Right? There's certain things that we need in life, but it's the wants, it's the longing, it's the craving through the eyes that's going to lead to discontentedness because it's longing for those pleasant feelings. So it's only a matter of time before it experiences painful feelings. And the Buddha saying here is that if we don't excite in them, if we don't welcome them, if we do, don't remain holding on to them, then the, conscious, and the consciousness is not dependent on them. If the consciousness isn't clinging to them, then without clinging, you can attain enlightenment, right? So eliminating this central desire where the mind's longing and yearning for certain physical forms through the eyes. But then there's these other aspects of the six sense bases. There's sounds through the ears that the mind will crave and yearn and long wanting these pleasant sounds, agreeable sounds. When it gets what it wants, it gets pleasant feelings. When it has a disagreeable sounds through the ears, then it's going to experience painful feelings. And then the same thing with odors through the nose, flavors through the tongue, physical objects coming in contact with the body, and then mental objects in the mind as well. This is like certain things that the mind is longing after. Like say you have a, a, a certain thing, say like uh, you're wanting peacefulness. And the mind is longing and yearning for peacefulness through the mind. And when you get that and you have peacefulness, you get these pleasant feelings. When the mind isn't peaceful, you get angry or you get upset. This is what I call being discontent because you're discontent, right? So as long as the mind is longing and yearning through these six sense bases, then it's going to be experiencing discontentedness. So the Buddha is saying, you know, essentially to let this go. Don't excite in these things. Don't long and yearn for these pleasant feelings. Don't welcome them. Don't remain holding on to them. Don't allow the consciousness to become dependent on them. Don't cling to it. Because if you do, then it's only a matter of time before it experiences discontentedness. So what you do is say you see this nice car and it's like, oh, wow, that's a beautiful car. It'd be lovely to have that car, but I don't have the money for that car. Oh, well, what's next? And you just move on, right? Rather than like, oh, man, I wish I had that car. Why can't I get that car? It's so beautiful. Oh, I want that car so badly, right? This is the longing and yearning. So you will encounter things that you're like, oh, wow, that's a beautiful car. Or, oh, wow, that's a beautiful view. Or, oh, wow, this chocolate cake is so delicious. But you don't allow the mind to cling to it, expecting it to be permanent. So you will still enjoy things as an enlightened being. But the mind just won't cling to it, expecting it and wanting it to be permanent because you already know that it's not permanent. So while you're enjoying the chocolate cake, it's like, oh, wow, this is great chocolate cake. But you're telling yourself it's not permanent, right? I'm not going to be able to get this all the time. And that's how you get liberated from longing through the sense bases. So now when you show up to the restaurant and you're like, hey, I'd like to order that piece of chocolate cake. They're like, oh, sorry, it's all gone. Oh, no big deal. Um, I'll take apple pie instead. Oh, we don't have apple pie. Okay, well, what do you have? We have vanilla ice cream. Okay, I'll take vanilla ice cream. Sounds good, right? So the mind can be content and peaceful with anything. It's no longer longing and yearning through these sense spaces for one specific thing where the Buddha is saying the consciousness becomes dependent on it right? The consciousness and having these pleasant feelings is dependent on getting the chocolate cake. And if I get the chocolate cake, I'll be happy. But if I don't get the chocolate cake, I'm going to be sad or angry or frustrated. That's what an unenlightened being experiences. But by you liberating the mind from this clinging and no longer holding on and realizing the chocolate cake's impermanent, you can be content and peaceful with whatever you end up eating. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? seeing any questions at this okay so we are studied this as part of volume nine in this program so now we go to chapter 126 uh, miranda would you please read that chapter yes sir thank you that spoken elimination venerables 
Venerable Sir, it is said, elimination, elimination. Through the elimination of what things is elimination spoken of? Form, Ananda, is impermanent, conditioned, pendently arisen, subject to destruction, to banishing, to fading away, to elimination. Through its elimination, elimination is spoken of. Feeling is impermanent. Perception is impermanent. Volitional formations or choices and decisions are impermanent. Consciousness is impermanent. It is through the elimination of these things, Ananda, that elimination is spoken of. All right. Thank you, Miranda. So here, the Buddha is explaining to eliminate the condition that form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness is what's causing and creating these pleasant feelings in the mind. Understanding that these five aggregates are impermanent, that the mind holding on to any of these five aggregates is going to experience discontentedness. And if you deeply understand this and you can see the truth in this, knowing that form, feeling, perception, volitional formation, and consciousness are impermanent, then you can actively train the mind to no longer cling to it. And then because you understand that it's impermanent, you're no longer clinging to it, then you've experienced elimination of craving or elimination of clinging. And this is where the mind can get to liberation, that it can be liberated from clinging to these things. So for example, say that you've made a plan to meet some friends at the movies and uh, three, four, five, six, eight, ten people are meeting you at the movies. You really want to see Spider-Man and you're like, man, I just got to see Spider-Man. And you show up and all your friends are there and it's like, all right, what movie are we going to see? And you're like, Spider-Man, Spider-Man, we got to see Spider-Man, Spider-Man. People are like, whoa, <laughs> you know, what's going on here? <laughs> you know, That would be craving and clinging. And now say the group wants to see Superwoman, but you want to see Spider-Man, right? And now you can't be content and you're kind of angry and disgruntled because everybody else wants to see Superwoman and you want to see Spider-Man, right? And now you're kind of disgruntled about coming out or you're even just disappointed that you came out with these friends because you had this craving and clinging. Whereas if the mind understands like, okay, I'm going out to spend time with my friends and I would like to enjoy our time together. The movie is almost... Know, immaterial. It's not all, even really that important. So when I show up, let's just collectively talk about what type of movie you would like to see. And then as we collectively talk about it, we might say, well, I would like to see Spider-Man, or I would prefer to see Spider-Man, or I would be interested to see Spider-Man. And somebody else says, well, I would like to see Superwoman. And then somebody else speaks up and says something else. And then collectively as a group, we just kind of make a decision and we can just be content and peaceful and joyful no matter what the decision is because we're not clinging to our choice. We're not clinging and craving to our choices and decisions. And this is where the mind can be liberated, where you can be content and peaceful and joyful no matter what movie you actually go see. And conversely, if we have this craving and clinging and we get angry because the group picks Superwoman, now we start having bitterness and hostility towards this group of people. This is where the mind becomes unskillful and we drive people away from us or we push people away from us uh, with this aggressiveness and bitterness. So you can get liberated from this and eliminate discontentedness by eliminating the craving and clinging towards form, feeling, perception, volitional formation and consciousness. What questions do you guys have on these? No questions at this time, sir. Okay, so let's go to chapter 127. Yeah, would you please read chapter 127 for me? Yes, thank you, Rick. The elimination of the five aggregates is the elimination of discontentedness. Monks, the elimination subsiding and passing away of form, of feeling, of perception, of volitional formations, of consciousness, is the elimination of discontentedness, the subsiding of disease, the passing away of aging and death. Monks, when a monk is practicing in accordance with the teachings, this is what accords with the teachings. He should re reside engrossed in fading away of strong feelings towards form, 
feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who resides engrossed in fading away of strong feelings towards form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formation, and consciousness. One who fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness is freed from form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. He is freed from birth, aging and death, freed from sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure and despair, freed from discontentedness, I say. Monks, when a monk is practicing in accordance with the teachings, this is what accords with the teachings. He should reside reflecting on impermanence in form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who resides reflecting on impermanence in form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness is freed from form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. He is freed from birth, aging, and death, freed from sorrow, grief, pain, excuse me, <coughs> displeasure, and despair, freed from discontentedness, I say. Monks, when a monk is practicing in accordance with the teachings, this is what accords with the teachings. He should reside reflecting on discontentedness, in form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. I wonder if someone else could read. My throat is quite dry and I'm going to cough quite a bit. Thank you. I was, uh, can you tell me where you left off? Right here, Rick. Right. Right. One who resides reflecting on discontentedness in form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness is freed from form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. is freed from birth, aging, and death, freed from sorrow, grief, pain, displeasure, and despair, freed from discontentedness. Monks, when a monk is practicing in accordance with the teachings, this is what accords with the teachings. He should reside reflecting on non-self in form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. One who resides reflecting on non-self in form, feeling, perception, formations, and consciousness fully understands these things. One who fully understands form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness is freed from them. He is freed from birth, aging, and death, freed from sorrow, grief, pain, pleasure, despair, freed from discontent. Right. Thank you, Anne and Rick. So here, prior to this, remember the Buddha introduced the five aggregates, right? And he's saying this is what makes a living being a living being is these five aggregates, form, feeling, perceptions, volitional formations, or choices and decisions, and consciousness. But in order to eliminate discontentedness in this disease, right? The Buddha is talking about discontentedness as a disease. This is where some people refer to the Buddha almost like a doctor because his teachings are a prescription for this disease of discontentedness so that we can eliminate it. We're just like there's symptoms, which is the disease or the discontentedness. And then there's this prescription or this antidote, which is his teachings. He's saying, as he goes through here, that the uh, five aggregates are impermanent, right? And understanding that deeply, that the five aggregates are impermanent. And we just saw that with Jan, right? The physical form, she could speak, she could talk, and uh, she was able to read, but the physical form was impermanent. She was getting some scratchiness in her throat, and she started coughing and you know it's impermanent that Jan's reading because of this physical form is impermanent this is where you can independently observe the truth for yourself 
that these things are 100% true that the Buddha is talking about. So rather than Jan clinging to her decision or her volitional formation to read, she's like, you know what, let me just let this go and offer for somebody else to potentially read, right? And then the mind can reside peaceful because I understand this physical form is impermanent. I can't cling to it. And if I cling to it, expecting it to always be permanent, then there's going to be discontentedness. So this is where you can let go. So deeply soaking into the mind, the understanding that these five aggregates are all impermanent and developing that really deeply in the mind. And that if clinging to those five aggregates, it's going to experience discontentedness. Through clinging to any of these five aggregates, the mind's going to experience discontentedness. And then understanding that none of these five aggregates are the self. So while these five aggregates are the living being, this five aggregates is what makes a living being, none of these are the self. So this physical form is not who you are as a person. The feelings that you experience in the mind is not who you are. The perceptions, the beliefs and opinions and views about the world around you, that's not who you are. The choices and decisions that you're making now or that you've made in the past, that's not who you are as a person. This is where I say that, you know, I might disagree with somebody's decisions, but I can love the person, right? Because somebody's choices and decisions aren't who they are as a person. And then this consciousness is not who you are. This mind is not who you are. Essentially, what he's doing is he's connecting the three universal truths to the five aggregates. And in order to get to the first stage of enlightenment, a person, a practitioner would need to understand these five aggregates and that the elimination of discontentedness comes through the elimination of craving and clinging to these five aggregates and ultimately understanding that they're impermanent. So why should I cling to them? Because I'm just setting myself up to fail if I cling to these impermanent things because it's only a matter of time before they fade away or no longer exist. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Do you have any questions? Yes, sir. On YouTube, Chris Rice asks, what does it mean that the elimination of choices and decisions is the elimination of discontentedness? Yeah, so what you're doing is you're eliminating your craving and clinging to your choices and decisions. So an enlightened being is still going to make choices and decisions, but they're no longer clinging to them, right? So that's the elimination of discontentedness. So if you eliminate your clinging to choices and decisions, you won't experience discontentedness because of it. If you cling to your choices and decisions, you're going to experience discontentedness as part of that. So let's just say I decide to uh, rent an apartment and I rent that apartment and I move in and I'm there for six months or nine months. My I really like it. It's got a great view. It's really peaceful. I really enjoy being here in this rented apartment. But then say some neighbors move in next door and they're really noisy, right? And now I'm clinging to this decision of staying in this apartment. And now I'm not willing to let it go. And I just stay in that situation. And every time these people make noise, the mind gets discontent, right? Because of the noise, because of clinging to the apartment, because of clinging to my decision to be in this apartment, where if you train the mind to let go uh, and no longer have cringing, craving and clinging through the sense bases and through your choices and decisions, you might choose to move on and move to another location or change where you reside. But as long as you cling to that decision of being in the apartment, you're not going to be able to experience liberation and, discon and, and uh, peacefulness. Another example using that same exact thing is like, say uh, you're in this apartment and now the landlord has decided to demolish the apartment and rebuild a nicer, newer apartment. And now because of your clinging to this beautiful view and this nice apartment that you're renting or this nice condo, when you find out that the apartment is going to be demolished, you now become discontent because you're clinging and holding on to this choice and decision. So by eliminating the choice and decision, by letting that go, realizing that your choice to stay in this apartment was always impermanent. So 
it was only a matter of time before you needed to move out of this apartment anyway. Then you can get liberated so that when somebody says, oh, we need to demolish the building, everyone needs to move out in about three months. Oh, okay, I understand. I'll look for a new place. Rather than like, what, are you crazy? I gotta move out, how dare you do this to me? You know, this is my favorite place to live, uh, right? Like all this unskillful conduct that might come out as a result. Whereas if when you hear that you need to move, you just recognize it as impermanence and okay, well, it was only a matter of time before something like that occurred because this place where I'm living is not permanent. And now you can just choose to move on to another place. And that would be how you get liberated from clinging to volitional formations or choices and decisions. Yes, thank you, sir. Um, and then Tonka asks if you could explain more how craving for consciousness would look in everyday living, giving some examples perhaps. Sure, so clinging to the consciousness would be like that self-identity that we talk about with the personal existence view. If you're clinging to, I am a grandmother, I am a mom, I am a uh, senior living uh, employee, or I'm not sure what your title is at work, what you actually uh, title is, or any of that self-identity, right? Uh, I am uh, a Canadian, or your other country where you came from originally, if you were craving like, I am this, and that's what you're holding on to in the consciousness, if you're clinging to that, when somebody says, oh, Canadians are so amazing, they're so lovely, they're so friendly, oh, pleasant feelings. But then when you hear something where somebody says something disparaging about Canadians, then you'll feel sad or you feel angry or frustrated. So by you letting go of the craving and clinging, holding on to this consciousness and this mind, then you realize that this isn't who you are as a person and you can get liberated from that. Thank you, sir. It appears there are no. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, also, just my own question. Um, would it be wise, sir, while one is not yet enlightened and so is not yet free from discontentedness, when we do experience discontentedness, for us to then later on reflect on the arising, the changing, the fading away, and the eventual ceasing, um, of that discontentedness to fully absorb the impermanence of that in the mind, sir? Yeah, one of the things that's really wise, like as soon as discontentedness comes, just realize right away that it's impermanent, right? Because oftentimes we dwell in the discontentedness and it makes it more intense and it makes the duration longer. Because the mind's thinking that it's permanent, that this sadness or this anger, or this uh, frustration is permanent. So it kind of makes it more intense and it makes the duration longer. So right away, it reminds yourself, okay, this discontentedness is impermanent. It's just a matter of me figuring out what the craving desire attachment is here and eliminate that so that then I can eliminate this discontentedness. And this can be really helpful for the mind to help you get back to some peacefulness. And along those lines of developing the perception of impermanence in the mind is uh, while you're meditating, you know, sometimes when I used to first start meditating and I was trying to develop the perception of impermanence in the mind, and as I was meditating, I would hear a sound and I would just tell myself, hmm, that's impermanent. And then I would see the arising of the sound, I would see the changing of it, and I would see it fade away. And this helps to develop the perception of impermanence in the mind. The Buddha talks about this at various points in his teachings about developing this perception of impermanence so that you understand all these things are impermanence around you. And this will help you to then train the mind to not cling. Because if you're clinging to your feelings, here talking about the five aggregates, clinging to the feelings is when you experience this happiness, this excitement, this elation, if you cling to that, you welcome it, you want it to continue, you're desiring for it to continue, then you're clinging to your feelings and you're setting yourself up to fail. That it, it's only a matter of time before this pleasant feeling is gone because it arose, it's gonna change and fade away. So if you already know that the feeling is impermanent, then you won't allow the mind to kind of revel in this pleasantness that you might, like I said, eat the chocolate cake. It's like, oh wow, that's really good chocolate cake. Mm, that's really good. 
Um, but then when it's over, it's over. It's done. You move on. You're not clinging to it. You're not expecting or wanting or craving for it to be there the next time. So this is how you train the mind throughout your day as you see discontentedness, as you see those pleasant feelings arise, you cut those off and you let it go. As you see painful feelings arise, you cut that off and let it go. Neither painful nor pleasant, cut that off and let it go. Never allowing the mind to grasp and hold on to any of these feelings because you know it's only a matter of time before they're gone. So then just take active steps to eliminate them from the mind. And then when you clear out all that pollution where the mind's craving and clinging to things, then it can just reside in the middle all the time and always be peaceful and joyful. But as long as the mind's basing its feelings on some impermanent condition, that craving is there, that clinging is there, basing its inner feelings on some impermanent condition, you're going to keep experiencing this up and down and up and down and up and down. That's why when you see the mind even starting to go up just a little bit, jump on that and cut it off. Or you see the mind going down into sadness or loneliness or boredom, cut that off and let it go. And sometimes the best way to do that is to redirect the mind. So if you're sitting at home, you're like, oh, I feel a little bit bored. Oh, no, nope. let me go outside. Let me go for a walk, right? Go take a walk somewhere or, you know, just redirect the mind somewhere else. But sometimes it's even okay to just sit with the boredom and just feel that and be like, okay, the mind's bored, but this is impermanent. I can let this go. I need to just train the mind to be here and do nothing. So you have to look at the mind. There's not just one set thing that you always do, except for cutting it off and letting it go. In some situations, you might redirect the mind by going out for a bike ride or a walk or something like that. In other situations, it might be wise to sit there and just allow the mind to understand that it's bored and actively work to cut that off and not expect to always be involved in something. So this is where you are working with the practice, you're working with the tools that the Buddha provides us to actively move the mind to this middle way and this peacefulness. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Um, I have a question in relation to this in the next chapter is the word elimination itself. And um, for instance, in this lifetime, probably I will have uh, most of my five senses working. And so what I was wondering is if there would be another word for elimination, because even through my practice, I'm not going to eliminate my or my, my seeing. I'm assuming what this means is that I'm eliminating my attachment to these things. I'm just wondering. Yeah, the word elimination here is eliminating the clinging to form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and eliminating the craving for these things to be permanent. Thank you. And there are no more questions that I'm aware of. Right, so we'll move on to the next chapter. Chapter 128. I'll read that. The elimination of the six sense bases is the elimination of discontentedness. Monks, the elimination, subsiding, and passing away of the eye, ear, nose, tongue, body, and mind is the elimination of discontentedness, the subsiding of sickness, the passing away of aging and death. Monks, the elimination, subsiding, and passing away of forms, sounds, odors, flavors, and physical objects, and mental objects, is the elimination of discontent, the subsiding of sickness, the passing away. Yes, so thank you, Rick. This is what we've been talking about throughout the last couple of chapters is the clinging, the craving through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the body, and the mind. By eliminating that clinging, you eliminate discontentedness. By eliminating discontentedness, the mind is enlightened. And now there's this subsiding of sickness in the passing away of aging and death, meaning there's no longer going to be any rebirth. So the way that you do that is no longer have this craving and clinging for agreeable forms through the eyes, agreeable sounds, odors, flavors, physical objects, and mental objects, because 
this is where the word discontentedness is so helpful that if we use the word suffering, we tend to just think about painful feelings. But to really get ahead of the curve and understand discontentedness, it's important to understand those pleasant feelings of happiness, excitement, elation, thrill, euphoria, and others, because that's where the mind is longing for those pleasant feelings. And as long as we allow it to do that, it's only a matter of time before we experience painful feelings. But sometimes these things are so far removed from each other that we don't associate in the unrelated state that one is actually causing the other. So if you had a new job and you were like really longing and yearning for this new job, you prepared your resumes, you sent them out, you went for the interview, you got really excited, you got this new job, you got more money, you got a promotion, you're feeling really good at this job, and wow, there's all this excitement and all this thrill, all this euphoria because of this new job. But now you start working there, and gradually over six months or a year, the feelings start to fade away. Because you based your inner feelings of this happiness, excitement, and elation on the new job, the new money, the new title, all this stuff, because that's what arose the pleasant feelings. Those pleasant feelings are impermanent. And now six months, a year, two years later, it's like, ah, I hate my job. I can't stand this job or, you know, I don't like this job anymore. You're starting to have all these painful feelings associated with the job. The reason why is because two years ago or a year ago or six months ago, you allowed the mind to indulge in these pleasant feelings. And because you based your inner feelings on the condition of this new job, new raise, new title, it's only a matter of time before those fade away. And now the mind experiences these painful feelings. And sometimes these are so far removed from each other, the unenlightened mind doesn't understand that that's what's going on. So when you understand that that's what's going on, now you can get ahead of the curve. So that when you apply for the new job, you don't allow the mind to get excited and so euphoric, right? Or if you go for an interview, you don't get so excited and thrilled and euphoric. You just stay calm and you just go in there with confidence and you share what your credentials are and why you feel you would be a good choice for this job. And then when you get the job, you don't get excited and euphoric. It's like, all right, great. I got this new job. This is wonderful. But you already know that this new job is impermanent. So you just do the job, you do it well, and you apply your effort and energy to performing well, but you don't allow the mind to revel in those pleasant feelings. So therefore, you can have this uh, long-term benefit of being in this job because you're not going to experience the painful feelings associated with it because you never allowed the mind to experience the pleasant feelings. Here's a little more simple example. Ilan has been doing spelling tests recently in his new grade. He's in like fourth grade or something. And he's been getting good grades uh, on his spelling test. And I said to him uh, yesterday, I said, "Um, did you take your test on Friday? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, oh, you're really excited to get a a, a perfect score? He's like, no, I'm not excited. I'm I'm not sure that I, I scored well or not. I was like, why aren't you excited? You know, you should be excited. You know, sometimes I try to see where his mind's at and trying to see what he's thinking. And he's like, no, dad. He's like, I'm not interested in being excited because if I don't get a perfect score, then it's only, you know, I'm going to end up being sad about that. So I'd rather just go in, do the test, uh, do my best. And whatever score I get is that's the score I get. All right. Good job. Right. Because that's the way that I've been training his mind to be able to do that. So you should do that with everything that you're working on, is not allowing the mind to revel in these pleasant feelings. This is completely opposite to the way that the mind has been functioning your whole life. The mind has been chasing after these pleasant feelings, wanting the happiness and excitement, and you have set your sights on certain uh, objectives because you're craving those pleasant feelings and you're chasing after those things. But this is what's leading to the painful feelings. So this is where you practice to have goals, objectives, and interest. You work towards a certain goal or a certain objective or a certain interest, but you're not going to allow the mind to chase after it like a wild animal chasing its prey. Because if you do that, you're going to get discontentedness, these pleasant feelings, and then you're going to get this discontentedness of painful feelings. So the Buddha is explaining to you here to eliminate the longing and yearning through the six sense bases of the eyes, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. 
And again, you're learning, but you're reflecting and then you're practicing. So you can actually look back over any situations where your mind has been discontent and you should see that there's something that the mind was longing for through these sense bases. You wanted and chased after the objects of your affection through these sense bases. And you can delineate and see how true the Buddhist teachings are. Because if he's saying discontentedness is occurring because of longing through these sense bases, then anytime your mind is angry or frustrated or irritated, not only should you be able to see the craving that caused it, but you should be able to trace it to specific sense bases. Either there was craving through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, the bodily contact, or a mental object. There was something that the mind was longing for. And when you can see your cravings that clearly through the six sense bases, now your mind is getting closer and closer to that first stage, that second stage, that third stage of enlightenment, because you're understanding the six sense bases and craving so deeply that you can trace your own discontentedness to specific sense bases that you're experiencing craving through. What questions do you guys have in this chapter? I think there are no questions at this time, sir. All right, so we're at 129. Wonderful. Uh, Miranda, would you please read this chapter for us? Yes, sir. Thank you. Craving abandoned. No more subject to future arising. Radha, whatever desire there is for form, whatever lust, excitement, craving, abandon it. Thus, that form will be abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. Radha, Whatever desire there is for feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, whatever lust, excitement, craving, abandon it. Thus, that feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness will be abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated, so that it is no more subject to future arising. Radha, whatever desire there is for form, Whatever lust, excitement, craving, whatever engagement and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying tendencies, abandon them. Thus that form will be abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. Radha, whatever desire there is for feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness, whatever lust, excitement, craving, whatever engagement and clinging, mental standpoints, adherences, and underlying ten tendencies, abandon them. Thus that feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness will be abandoned, cut off at the root, made like a palm stump, obliterated so that it is no more subject to future arising. All right, thank you, Miranda. This is the same topic that we've already been talking about, but he's just adding some different words here that I'll help you uh, here. He talks about abandoning <clears throat> the craving. You know, this is the cutting off that we talk about is applying right effort to cut it off at the root, right? And if you've ever been around a palm stump, you know, the, a palm tree, you know, making it like a, a, the stump of a, of a palm tree is what he's talking about. And it's very, you know, low to the ground. It's very uh, wide as well. Then he's talking here about obliterating it. This is the way you think about these three poisons or three unwholesome roots. This is the way you think about the 10 fetters is obliterating it, destroying it, right? That's how you get it out of the mind. Another way to think about it is like if you had a wet rag and you're just wringing the rag out and get every last little drop of central desire out of the mind, for example, or every little drop of conceit out of the mind. Don't allow there to be any residual conceit or any residual uh, central desire. It's like stomping on it and just obliterating it with your foot. And that's what the Buddha is explaining here is to obliterate the craving for form, feeling, perception, volitional formations, and consciousness. Don't allow it to even reside in the mind just a small tinge not even a small little residual amount because 
you can get to the point where you've made so much progress with the enlightened mind and getting close to enlightenment where you're not really experiencing any significant discontentedness. You're just experiencing a little bit of ickiness here and there, right? Just here and there, maybe once every three months, once every six months, there's just a little bit of ickiness. This is because there's still residual craving in the mind. The mind's not yet enlightened. And in this situation, the mind can become fairly complacent because it's not a big deal. It's just a little bit of ickiness. You experience it for 30 seconds or a minute, and then it's over with. But that's still craving that's producing that little bit of discontentedness. So what you need to do is obliterate it, destroy it, wring out the rag, get every last little drop out, stomp on it and crush it or scatter it like the Buddha was talking about. This is how you get to complete liberation of the mind. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? Looks like we don't have questions. Okay. So now we go to chapter 130. This is the last one for today. Uh, Jan, are you up for reading this particular chapter? Yes, I think so. Thank you, Rick. Elimination of craving called the laying down of the burden. And one, what, monks, is the laying down of the burden? It is the remainderless fading away and elimination of that same craving, the giving up and letting go of it, freedom from it non-reliance on it. This is called the laying down of the burden. This is what the perfectly enlightened one said. Having said this, the fortunate one, the teacher, further said this, the five aggregates are truly burdens. The burden carrier is the person. Taking up the burden is discontentedness in the world. Laying the burden down is joyful. Having laid the burden, heavy burden down, Without taking up another burden, having taken out craving from its root, one is free from hunger, fully extinguished. Please, thank you, Jan. So here, the Buddha is now associating this craving, desire, attachment, this mental longing and strong eagerness, chasing after the objects of your affection. He's describing it as a burden because it's a real burden to bear, to chase after this. This is where... Maybe before you started learning these teachings and practicing very closely, you get to the end of your day and you're just wiped out, just completely wiped out because the mind's been chasing and craving so much throughout your day that by the end of your day, it was such a burden to carry all this craving that you're just completely wiped out. An enlightened being doesn't experience that. An enlightened being doesn't experience tiredness. The mind gets sleepy and they need to sleep in order to allow the body and the mind to sleep, but they don't get tired where they're just completely exhausted because they're practicing the middle way. This exhaustion would be not the middle way, right? But then also sitting around in a lap of luxury and doing nothing all day, that's not liberation either. So this middle way is that we're applying effort and energy towards our goals and objectives, but we do that in a very consistent, gradual way or slowly, slowly. By carrying around the burden of craving, you're not going to do that. You're not going to do things slowly and gradually. You're going to want it now, want it now, want it now. Chase after it, chase after it, chase after it. I'm not going to be content until I get it. I'm not going to be content until I get it. All right, I got it. Oh, happy feelings, happy feelings. Oh, but they're starting to fade and I don't like that. And now there's sadness. Oh, I don't really like this. And now there's this up and down and up and down. So it's a real burden to carry around this craving and clinging to the five aggregates. That's what the Buddha is explaining here, that these five aggregates are a real burden. And by eliminating craving, desire, attachment through breathing mindfulness meditation, through generosity, through all the other teachings, you're laying down this burden. You're laying down the burden of constantly chasing after the objects of your affection. And then here the Buddha explains that this person is the burden carrier. So there's the physical body, and then there's the mind. And inside the mind, there's craving and clinging, the longing and yearning. This is the burden that's being carried. The connection of the body and the mind coming together, this is the person who's now carrying this burden that's in the mind, right? So that's what he's describing here. 
taking up the burden is discontentedness. If you pick up craving, desire, attachment, if you allow the mind to hold on and cling, you're picking up the burden. So if you're meeting a new friend and you feel the mind like, oh, I want this person's phone number. I want to see them tomorrow. You know, you feel the mind longing and yearning and jumping forward. You're picking up the burden. You're starting to carry this burden. Or if you are longing and yearning for anything, you're picking up this burden. You're taking up the burden and it's going to experience discontentedness. But by laying down the burden of craving, desire, attachment, now this is joyful because the mind can be liberated. Sometimes when the mind eliminates these cravings, you can actually feel them get eliminated from the mind. The Buddha calls this maturing in release where you've accumulated the benefits of your practice so well that eventually you get to the point where it matures and accumulates the benefits and now it releases. And all of a sudden there's this joy that comes into the mind. It's like, oh wow, I just felt that craving release. So laying down the craving is joyful. And then the Buddha describes the rest of it here where he says, okay, one who is free from hunger, meaning not literally food, you know, because you need food, but this in unquenchable thirst of chasing after the objects of your affection. That's what he's talking about. This craving, this hunger, this chasing after the objects of your affection. When one is free from this hunger, this craving, then the mind is fully extinguished discontentedness. By getting rid of the craving, desire, attachment from its root, obliterating it, destroying it, wringing out that rag. Now the mind is no longer longing and yearning through these sense bases. It's no longer clinging and craving, holding on to these five aggregates. Now the mind is liberated. It's fully extinguished. It will no longer experience any discontentedness and it will no longer experience any rebirth. What questions do you guys have on this chapter? And all. Are you able to take it or would you like me to? Yes, sir. I can get these two. Um, on YouTube, Anka asks, would it ever be appropriate to get excited about an event coming, a child getting married or something like that, sir? If you get excited, then you're, it's only a matter of time before the painful feelings come in at some point. Uh, so that's the problem is the mind wants to base its inner feelings on these impermanent conditions. And this really is a struggle for the unrelated mind because it has to let go of this temporary happiness in order to get to this permanent joy. So if your granddaughter or your, or your son or, or whoever is, is getting married or going off to college and you feel this excitement coming into the mind, you restrain the mind. You're like, nope, I'm not going to allow the mind to do that. I'm pleased for them. It's wonderful that they're getting married very pleased for them. This is outstanding. Wonderful. Uh, I'm here to support you and encourage you. Absolutely wonderful that you're getting married. But you can do that from the middle way rather than allowing the mind to get excited and elated or thrilled because of this. Oh, I'm going to get, you know, to walk down the aisle or I'm going to get to sit in the front of the, 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 uh, ceremony or whatever it is. Oh, I feel so prideful, right? This is where the mind might take on these pleasant feelings and you're trying to cut that out and just be pleased with this person. It's like, oh, wow, they're getting married. This is wonderful. I'll go shopping. I'll get them a gift or I'll go to their event and I'll wish them well. I'll spend some time with them. I'll have some food with them. I will congratulate them. I will get to spend time with their partner, whatever it is. You know, you can do these things and you can enjoy it. But when you allow the mind to go into this excited state, that's where you're setting yourself up to fail. So where you feel the mind doing that, that's where you pull it back and you restrain it. Thank you, sir. Also on YouTube, Chris Rice asks, if the five aggregates are not the person, then what is the person, sir? The person is just the combination of the body and the mind coming together. We call this the person, but that's not the self. The self uh, is non-existent. The unenlightened mind thinks that the physical body is who you are as a person, or it thinks that the mind is who you are as a person. 
but the Buddha is saying that this self-image isn't who you are and this self-identity is not who you are. There is no self there. So this unique combination of the physical body and mind coming together, we call this a person. You know, David Roylance is a label that was given to me at a certain time. And now this label is identifying this person that we call David Roylance. So if you see the a picture, it's like, oh, that's David Roylance. Or if you see him walking down the street, it's like, oh, that's David Roylance. But whatever clothes I'm wearing, uh, whatever my hair looks like, or whatever my skin looks like, that's not who I am as a person. Or whatever I'm involved in. Like, so if I'm uh, eating at a vegetarian restaurant, that's not who I am as a person. That's just a choice that I'm making is to eat vegetarian food or vegan food. Or if I'm choosing to teach Buddhist teachings, I'm choosing to share the teachings of the Buddha, but I am not a Buddhist teacher. That's self-identity. Someone else might say, oh, he's a Buddhist teacher. Yeah, that kind of helps people know what I do and what my role in society is. But the mind has to understand that this I am, this holding on to a self-identity, that's not who I am. So we're just using this word person to refer to the combination of the body and the mind coming together. And that's what we will refer to as a person. And now this is a person or this is a human being. Uh, and that's how we use the word person. This is what, this can actually be very helpful for you as you're training your mind, that you think about the mind as this third entity, that there's the body, there's the mind, and then there's the person. And it's the person looking at the mind, observing the mind, and then making decisions about how to train this mind. You observe the craving arising, and the person's like, no, 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 I'm not going to let you crave. I'm going to restrain you and pull you back. So the person is kind of like the adult in the room that is observing the mind and saying, yeah, that's kind of unwholesome. You shouldn't be doing that. Or, oh, that's really wholesome. You should continue to do that. Or, oh, you've got some craving there. Let me restrain you from doing that. Because if you go forward with that craving, it's going to produce unwholesome results. So the person is just an easy way to refer to the body and the mind coming together. And uh, it's not necessarily an entity by itself. It's just a description of the body and the mind coming together. But this body and mind is not who you are as a person. It's just a easy way for us to label this body and mind coming together and we say that's a person yes sir thank you um he does follow up with a question which meditation is better to eliminate self-identity view breathing mindfulness meditation or loving kindness meditation so in order to get to the point where the mind's ready to let go of personal existence view, there needs to be all this preliminary work done where there's the understanding and practice of the three universal truths, the Four Noble Truths, the Eightfold Path, the Five Precepts. You're building up your understanding of all the other teachings. You're practicing meditation of breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness meditation in order to train the mind to eliminate craving and anger. And as you're building that up, you're getting the mind to the point where it's willing to let go of this personal existence view. And so breathing mindfulness meditation is preparing the mind to do that. But to actually eliminate personal existence view, there's a specific meditation that I teach in chapter 11 called meditation to realize non-self. This one you would need to do with a really deep understanding of what personal existence view is and how the mind is arising discontentedness because of it, so that then you can apply the Eightfold Path to cut that off and let it go wherever you see it arising in daily life. But then on the side, you're also training the mind with meditation to be able to let that go more and more. So you can't just meditate your way to eliminating personal existence view. There needs to be certain intellectual understanding of it, there needs to be reflection and realizing how it's causing you complications. And then there needs to be practice of right mindfulness that you're aware of any discontentedness that is arising due to personal existence view. And then you're applying right effort to cut it off and let it go wherever you see that occurring in daily life. But then on the side, you're doing this training with the meditation to also help you as well. 
So all of these things are culminating together and helping you to progress to the elimination of personal existence view. So it's not that breathing mindfulness meditation and loving kindness is leading to the elimination of personal existence view. All of these things are leading to the elimination of the 10 fetters, but there's specific things that you're doing as part of the totality of your practice that is leading to your ability to eliminate personal existence view. And you need to accumulate enough benefits of the core practice of the Eightfold Path to prepare the mind to be willing to let go of personal existence view. And you can't meditate your way to the elimination of personal existence view. There needs to be that intellectual understanding, that reflection, and then the practice where you're practicing mindfulness, applying right effort, cutting that off whenever you see discontentedness arising related to personal existence view. And then just on the side, you might be practicing some of that meditation to realize non-self. And we have two more questions. So Chris asks two questions. One is, I understand that practitioners want to build up to meditating two or three times a day, 30 plus minutes each. But is there a higher amount to take or toward nationwide? It's up to each individual practitioner. I suggest that you work up to a minimum of 30 minutes per day. I mean, sorry, sorry, 30 minutes per session, because that's where you're going to see the most benefits. When you're doing five or 10 minutes, it's not like it's unbeneficial. It's certainly beneficial. And early in practice, that just might be where you are. But as you get closer and closer to 30 minutes or more, that's where you're going to notice the most benefits. So I say 30 minutes or more because it's up to your personal choice what you would like to do. But that's where you see the most benefits is two to three sessions a day, 30 minutes or more. And the second question is from Chris on YouTube. Does an enlightened person still enjoy food that tastes good? And if so, how is his enjoyment or dispassion toward good tasting food different from an unenlightened person? Yes, an enlightened being knows when they're eating food that it tastes good, that it's enjoyable. Like, wow, this really is good tasting food. But their mind doesn't cling to that. It doesn't allow pleasant feelings to rise in the mind. So an enlightened being, as they're eating the chocolate cake, it's like, oh, wow, this is some really good chocolate cake. But then when it's done, it's done and it's over with and they move on. Where an enlightened being, or I'm sorry, an unenlightened being might be eating the chocolate cake and be like, oh, this is my last bite. Mm. Oh my goodness, it's so good. Oh, I can't wait to come back next week and get this chocolate cake again. I just can't wait to come back, right? This is the longing and yearning. I just can't wait to come back and get some chocolate cake, right? Uh, so that's because the mind, when they're eating it, they're allowing those pleasant feelings to arise and they're now clinging to those pleasant feelings, wanting those pleasant feelings to persist and last. Where an enlightened being, as they're eating the chocolate cake, they already know that it's impermanent. They're not going to allow pleasant feelings to arise, but they're going to know that it tastes good and they're going to enjoy it while they're eating it. But then when it's done, it's done and it's over. And if I come back next week and happen to have that same chocolate cake, fine. But the mind's not reliant on it, using some of the language from the discourses today. The mind isn't reliant on, these, on this chocolate cake in order for it to uh, enjoy life. An enlightened being is just going to be enjoying life all the time. Whether you have chocolate cake or not, you can still enjoy life. It appears that there are no more questions. All right. Well, I'll just end by thanking all of you for joining for today's class. I see we went a little bit over as we get into the detail of the teachings, which is fine. You know, we typically will teach for uh, just two hours, but sometimes we go a little bit over. Sometimes we're a little bit short. So thank you guys for learning and understanding these teachings. Next week on the Saturday that we're doing the Polycan in English study group, we're going to do the next 10 chapters. So chapters 131 to 140 is where we'll be in our class next week. Tomorrow in the group learning program, we're going to be in chapter 21 of volume one. This is titled Do No Harm, uh, What 
is the future of our planet. And we're gonna be having a discussion around this in our group learning program. And then on Wednesday, we're gonna be doing breathing mindfulness meditation together. So you're welcome and invited to attend any and all of these classes. Have a very lovely and wonderful rest of your day. We'll see you next time. Sawadee Thank you again for watching. Enjoy your meditation. Look forward to seeing you online and answering any questions that you might have. Thank you so much. Thank you.